I'll let you know. Warn you. Okay, good. <laughs> it just told me it's recording. All right. So why am I here? Um, uh, many reasons why I'm specifically working with the Silver Bay Public Library. Thank you very much, Shannon, the director of the library. Um, is because my friend, Patty Paulson, who used to live in Robbinsdale, and I met because she's an artist, and behind me, but you can't see it, there is a watercolor she painted that I saw in 2009, and I was so taken with it that I sought Patty out because I wanted to buy it but I was hoping she would trade for massage therapy. And she said, yes. So <clears throat> that would began my friendship with Patty. And she has since uh, moved to Finland, Minnesota. So she's up near Silver Bay and now she is on the board of the Silver Bay Public Library. And so that's how I got connected with this particular organization. Um, just in the last, what, few months. At any rate, I was telling Patty a story about what I did in the mid 80s when I worked at the foot of the mountain theater. And I know Betsy and I bet Peggy, you both heard of that and kind of remember it or I've referred to it before. At any rate, um, I spent the whole decade of the 80s there. And, oh my goodness, that's 40 plus years ago, everybody. And uh, I did a number of things. By the time I got a particular phone call in 1983, I was working in the administrative end of the theater. I had started as a performer, but I was just kind of too good at the office stuff. And so I was answering the phone. And one day, a woman named Jeannie Young, who at that time was the director of another nonprofit in Minnesota, in St. Paul, called The Eclectic Company. That was a nonprofit of women musicians. And uh, they had gotten funding to do a project called the Women of Courage series. And the concept was aimed at elementary age children and uh, they wanted, well, as Jeannie put it, I asked her several questions uh, in preparation for tonight. And she's way busy with another nonprofit at the moment. But uh, someone had asked me, what were the eclectic, what was the eclectic company trying to address with this project? And here's the way Jeannie answered. Well, if you remember way back in the dark ages of 40 years ago, women's history was not much included in the history we all learned. Women of Courage was our effort to teach kids and adults about the many women who were an important part of our history. And that's one of the things that I loved about the project is that it was aimed so that children of elementary age could understand it and grasp the concepts. But it, for adults like me, who was in my mid thirties at the time, uh, I hadn't heard of, there's like 23 women uh, that they made stories about and songs for each one, but I had only ever heard of six of them. And I was in my mid thirties. And these are, they did important, wonderful, marvelous things. So including uh, Ida Lewis. Have you ever heard of Ida Lewis? Betsy, nope, Shannon had. I had never heard of her. She, uh, well, anyway, I've got ahead of myself. Let me get back to how I got into this. 
So one day I answered the phone at the theater at the foot of the mountain. And the voice on the other end said, hi, you know, I, we like your voice. Uh, <laughs> would you, we're doing this project and we're recording records, which is the technology in 1983. We're making recordings of women's stories in history that either you know about or you should have known about. And she said, somebody who's gonna record about Sally Ride later this week can't make it. Would you be interested? And I said, absolutely. You know, where do I go? So I got to go to a recording studio over by Loring Park and, and there was a script and I read through it and it reminded me of being in speech contests in high school, you know, to read through and practice it and give it, you know, intonation and all this. So I had great fun and they paid me something and they gave me a copy of the record um, and it was the third record that came out in this series. So um, that's how I originally was invited in. You know, they kind of needed somebody to fill in. And then they liked what I did. And so the next year, this went on for three years. The next year, I narrated a story about Ida Lewis, which I will read to you tonight. And the third year, I read a story about Mariah Mitchell. Have you ever heard of her? Love it. Okay. Now, I have to tell you, though, you've all heard of Sally Ride, right? Okay. I can't tell you how many people in their 30s or 40s I've talked to in the last, you know, month or so and just testing asked and they didn't know who Sally Ride was. They have no clue. Isn't that amazing? At any rate, so the work that this project set out to do is still necessary and relevant. And um, I'm hoping that hmm, talking about it out loud again will inspire the people who can uh, to carry it further, maybe reissue copies. You know, I, I personally, if I won the billion dollar Powerball right now, I would make sure there were copies in every public school library in the country. I don't see why not. At any rate. So do you want to hear a story about Ida Lewis? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> water. Thank you, Terry. I'm so excited. <laughs> this is okay. going to be great. <laughs> that song that was playing when you entered our conversation here, uh, uh, what the concept of the project was, each woman they focused on, uh, they wrote a narration about what was extraordinary about her life. And that was one side of a record that was the size of a 45. On the other side of the record was an original folk song written about the woman and her life by the women of the Eclectic Company who produced the project. Oh, thank you. Uh, Shannon's gonna show you a record, yes. And is that Ida Lewis? Which one is that? This one is Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, okay. Well, the, here's, here's the holder I've had since 1984. And this is Newport Harbor, was the song you were listening to when you walked in. And this is my narration. I got my name on some vinyl. Okay, <laughs> okay. Anyway, and then the each record came in a cover, but it wasn't just an album cover. It was oop, also a booklet with more additional information and another page of information. And 
Where's the words? Oops, more information. Wait a minute. There's a list. Oh, there's usually a list of words for the kids to look up. But on this one, there's the words to the song on the back and they give you ideas uh, for the kiddos to make write more verses to the song, et cetera. It, they really, it was really quite uh, uh, capable educational tool. And the art you see, I'm sure you can tell it's children's art. And what they did was after each record was, uh, each narration was recorded, they played it for the kids and played the song, went to a school to preview it and then had them draw art. And so that's the art that wound up on all the books. Okay. So that's Ida Lewis, and that's the story of how they were all produced. All right, so now it's story time. Okay. <clears throat> Fourteen-year-old Ida Lewis woke to the sounds of the sea. In the gray light of morning, she stretched her arms over her head as she listened to the waves break against Lime Rock Island and the call of seagulls overhead. She stole one more minute to curl up under the warmth of her quilt, and then feeling guilty, she got up. Across the room, her little sister was still fast asleep. Ida dressed quickly and quietly left the room. In the kitchen, her mother was already at work. How's father? asked Ida. Oh, he slept badly, answered her mother. It's this damp fall air. It makes the rheumatism worse. Ida yawned and stretched again. With her father sick, she alone was in charge of the Lime Rock Light. Throughout the night, every four hours, it was up to her to climb the long spiral staircase of the lighthouse to check the fuel and to make sure that the light burned strong and steady. The lives of many people were in her hands, for if the light went out, there was no way for ships to safely pass. Her father had taught her well. She knew how to clean and keep the light. She also knew what would happen if that light went out. She had heard stories of lighthouse keepers who had failed to keep their lights burning, stories of the many people who had drowned when ships had run aground with no light to guide them. Ida and her father had promised each other that while they kept Lime Rock Light, this would not happen in Newport Harbor. You can see I should have uh, put more light on in the room. At any rate, Ida's sister and brothers came into the kitchen carrying their school books wrapped in waterproof oilcloth. They ate their breakfast quickly and followed Ida out of the house. As they walked toward their boat, the sun broke through, promising some warmth to this chilly autumn day. The young ones scrambled into the boat as Ida pushed off from the rocky shore of their island. She began to row the heavy boat. Though she was small and thin, her strong arms moved the boat quickly across the water to the town of Newport. Have a good day in school, called Ida as her brothers and sister climbed out of the boat. They stopped to wave as she began to row back to Lime Rock. There was no school for Ida anymore. When her family moved to the lighthouse, her formal education had ended. Her mother was often sick and her father's rheumatism made his arm and leg so stiff and sore that he could not climb the steps of the lighthouse. The care of the house, the younger children, and the lighthouse were more and more left in Ida's strong hands. Ida brought the boat up to their dock and jumped out. She pulled her heavy shawl tight around her and for a moment enjoyed the warmth of the sun on her upturned face. Then she was off to help her mother with household chores. 
with so much to do. The day passed quickly. In the afternoon, she rode back to Newport to bring the children home from school. The wind had grown stronger and the trip to Newport and back was harder than it had been in the morning. In the late afternoon, Ida climbed the lighthouse steps to clean the light and fill the lamp with oil. When she was finished, she went into the kitchen. Her mother and father were resting and she could hear her brothers playing outside. She sat down and took off her shoes. She looked them over carefully, wondering if they would be mended again. A lighthouse keeper's pay was poor and new shoes were something they could little afford. Suddenly, she realized that the playful shouts of her brothers had changed. She went to the door. The boys were pointing out toward the open sea. She looked to where they were pointing and she saw a small sailing boat turned over on its side. She could see three, no, four people struggling in the water. Without a thought, she ran toward the dock. The sharp rocks cut into her bare feet, but she couldn't feel them. She jumped into her boat and began to row across the water. She heard her brothers shouting, hang on, Ida is coming. She rowed as hard as she could. And soon she could hear the cries of the people in the water, help, help. I can't swim, help me. She rowed even harder and quickly reached the first person. It was a young man, nearly twice her size. She reached over the side of the boat and with strength that amazed even her, pulled the man into the boat. She moved the boat to the next man and the next. The fourth man was on the other side of the capsized boat. He had stopped shouting and seemed to have run out of strength. He was sinking. Ida dived into the water for a few seconds. The heavy weight of her long skirts pulled her down and tangled around her legs. But then she began to swim toward the young man. She reached him and pulled him in to the surface. As he gasped for air, he began to struggle and fight her. For a moment, she feared he would pull her under and then would both, and they would both drown. Then suddenly he stopped struggling and Ida was able to pull him to the safety of the boat. Ida Lewis, barely 15 years old, had just saved four lives. In the years that followed, 14 other people came to owe their lives to Ida Lewis. For over 50 years, she kept the light of Lime Rock Lighthouse strong. The people of her community and of the entire United States honored her. She received medals, rewards, and the gift of a boat named Rescue. One day, the president of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant, visited her. As he stepped from his boat, a small wave broke over his feet. Oh, Mr. President, said Ida, you've gotten your feet wet. President Grant just laughed. Never mind, he said. To see Ida Lewis, I would gladly get my feet wet and gladly swim if necessary. In 1906, at the age of 64, Ida made her last rescue. Five years later, she died at Lime Rock Lighthouse. On the day of her death, the ships in Newport Harbor tolled their bells in her honor. Ida Lewis was the first woman lighthouse keeper in America, but more important, time and again, she bravely risked her own life to save others. Today, her monument is the Ida Lewis Yacht Club. The red flag of the club shows a lighthouse surrounded by 18 stars, one star for each life saved by Ida Lewis of Lime Rock Lighthouse. The end. <laughs> Terry, that yeah. was wonderful. Oh, thank you. I, and I have a tidbit that a dear friend shared with me. Where did I put that? Uh, in 1881. Oh, I know where it is. Just a minute. I have it. Let me access it here on my computer. You need people 
who are interested in women's history or all kinds of history, you need to know about this website. You, I think you'll be interested, Shannon, maybe you already know. It's called the Glinda Factor.com. The Glinda Factor.com. And it refers to the Good Witch, Glinda, the Good Witch. And I guess the tagline is You always had the power. Is that, is that right? You've always had your power. At any rate, there is a whole chapter on that website about Ida Lewis. And it tells that when she was recognized by the country, by the United States, and given a, a medal, she was the first woman to receive, where is the name of the medal? It's like the U.S. Oh, come on. I'm sorry. I'll find it. I want to get this right. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. Okay. All right, here it is. <laughs> she was the first, are you there? I'm sorry, I made you wait. She was the first woman to receive the life-saving medal of the first class. It was officially presented to her by Congress in 1881. But here's the fun part. One side of the medal depicts three men in a boat saving a woman from drowning at sea. So that's just kind of a little ironic. So I don't know if they've you know, updated the medals in Congress lately, but they should. <laughs> I just thought that was a riot. Um, that's so great. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, well, I was just going to say, if you wrote down that website, you'll find all kinds of interesting characters uh, on that page. I just, I didn't even know it existed before. What a wonderful uh, resource. Did you have a question, Shannon? No, I, well, I put the glindafactor.com in the chat. So the link is there for everybody. Oh, wow. um, you. So you can get to it. Um, and um, I, as I was listening to the story, it just it, uh, it gave me chills, right? To think about the bravery and like how young she was um, and how glad that story was captured. And it made me think about all the stories that weren't captured uh, that we might not ever hear, but so grateful for the ones that we do have. And it ties nicely into a question that we got in the chat um, from James that says, is there a story that's been particularly important to you personally? What is it? And I'll just add on why. <laughs> Uh, good question. Um, I mostly focus on the three that I did. And the very first one that I did was Sally Ride. And so that has always felt like the most important one to me. I don't by any means think uh, she's the most important woman in this group of 23. Um, Everybody makes different contributions, you know? Um, but I remember it was 1983 when she went up in space and it was in my lifetime. And it wasn't too long thereafter, they asked if I would narrate her story. And it was such a riveting thing at the time. I, I was just honored beyond words. And uh, I loved that it was uh, focused on an achievement that she had managed to accomplish, accomplish through many obstacles, overcoming many obstacles, um, to be the first American woman in space. And that but then what so what the story focuses on and what the song that the eclectic company wrote about Sally Ride focuses on is that because she did what she did children all over the world can understand that that's possible for them too that little girls and little 
little boys can say, oh, I want to grow up and be an astronaut just like Sally Ride, you know, which wasn't something you could say before. It reminds me of how I felt when Obama was elected president. You know, there were, I, I, I had tears because I knew just his being in that position and being who he was opened up so many possibilities in the minds of children everywhere, you know? So I, um, so that holds a dear space in my heart. Now I'll tell you a couple more reasons why. Okay. I can't resist. This is the, my first copy of Sally Ride. And it has this shiny sticker here. If I get it close, I don't know if you can read it, but it says it's an American Library Association notable children's recording. And I was very excited that that was true. You know, they had submitted all their issues for that year. And that year, that one record got that award. The next year, um, Ida Lewis got the same award. The sticker fell off. So that's the place where the sticker was. Anyway. American Library Association, notable children's recording. But the reason uh, Sally Ride is kind of my favorite is because, I don't know if it was that year or years later, I found out that the same year Sally Ride got that designation from the American Library Association, Meryl Streep had also done a children's recording that year that got the same award. So there. <laughs> it just cracked me up and it tickled me. So um, that's good company, Terry. <laughs> well, you know, in 1983, it was great company as far as I was concerned. So she's kind of my favorite. And uh, but it was also interesting to me. Uh, just last night, I was talking with another friend about this and she has access to listening to some of these stories but hasn't had time yet and she said oh and as a matter of fact because it's women's history month these stories are popping up you know around facebook and lots of places she said i just heard something on npr i think it was npr and not npr but it could have been either one I just heard the other day about the first woman astrophysicist, she said, American. And she was telling details. I said, you know, that sounds an awful lot like Mariah Mitchell, which is the third record that I did a, the story of. That was my third one. And it was, it was Mariah Mitchell. She said, yes, yes. I, re I don't remember her name, but I remember M.M. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, people are, and she's, you know, younger than I, but, you know, older than many. And uh, she'd never heard of Mariah Mitchell. And she's an important scientist, you know, so it's fun that the word is getting out in different ways. And I just want that to keep happening more. Any questions? I have a quick one, Terry, um, for you. Um, just throughout your career, I mean, you worked in theater um, and you did these stories. Um, and I'm just curious um, if you could speak just a little bit about how you see art and like women's women doing art as like an avenue for positive change. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, in trying to wrap my head around the enormity of the topic, women and art. Um, I said to Shannon, of course, wow, that's a broad subject. You're supposed to laugh now. Don't worry, I am. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, and, and it is, it's so enormous and so deep and forever. 
but I, I wrote down some notes to myself thinking, you know, kind of what has that meant to me? Well, I remember as a kid, I would never have described myself as an artist because I couldn't draw. I mean, I drew, uh, you know, but I didn't think it was very good. And, and in my vocabulary at that time, that was art. That was all that was art, you know. But, and the first time I got any sense of having some artistic talent was in eighth grade when our high school speech teacher, Miss Pearson, I think there's a few people listening that remember that woman. Um, and in eighth grade, every student at Coon Rapids Junior High uh, had to uh, take half a year of speech class, or maybe it was speech and drama, but I think it was just called speech. And so, you know, basically everyone needed to learn how to stand up in front of people and talk and <laughs> be able to do that. So at the end of the year, I just remember her, uh, the last day of class and walking out of the classroom and she said, when you get to high school, which would be two years later, you know, you need to do more speech and try out for plays and stuff like that. And I was like, really? <laughs> because I, I, I didn't know. I was just doing what I did and it was fun. And, and she saw something I didn't know about, right? And so that really, I really credit her with um, introducing me to an art that uh, I didn't even think was possible. And so then, of course, in high school, I had dreams of going to college. And then in college, I majored in theater. And I think at the time that I thought I would either be a teacher or a famous actress, you know. And so I started to keep diaries just in case I was famous and somebody ever needed them to refer to, you know, to explain how this incredibly talented person became such an incredibly talented actress. But thankfully I have since eliminated all that uh, teenage uh, diary writing and it's burned long ago. But at any rate, um, I, once I was out of college though, and then, and then I got lucky and worked in my thirties at the foot of the mountain theater for a decade. And that felt really good because it was a theater focused on social justice, which when I was in college, I had started to wake up about that. Uh, and protested the Vietnam War, et cetera. And so just starting to wake up and learned a lot in those years. And then this being part of this project was another piece of that. Um, and so the older I've gotten, of course, the more I understood and realized that almost the, nearly everything a woman does, in my opinion, is art. <laughs> it's whether it's, you know, a performance art or a, a storytelling art or a singing art in the choir at church or uh, decorating your kids' birthday cakes or uh, making a quilt or, uh, you know, we call much of that craft but it's art and it's so uh, intrinsic and important and basic to everything we do in our lives. It, it's, uh, it's our self-expression, you know, and it's how we show love to our families and our communities. And um, that's what I see. And I have been so blessed because of uh being in a nonprofit professional theater to 
run into uh, many artists who have managed to make a living doing all kinds of art, whether it's musical art or uh, visual art or, you know, I, the reason I wanted Shannon to say I'm an amateur storyteller is because I know some storytellers that are whew, incredible and professional, like Kevin Kling, Minnesota storyteller who's and and author who's just outrageous and uh, Danielle Daniel somebody I worked with at the theater and she still does an incredible job of storytelling in Minnesota and all over the country and I've known playwrights and uh well, I made a list anyway I've been really lucky to know all these women meet all these women and you know I think honestly Betsy I think of you to know about wine the way you do, just to pick one thing, <laughs> you know, is it, it's an art to be able to decorate the way you do. And my sister is an interior designer, um, is astonishing to me. It's, it's a fabulous art. And, you know, Peggy, I know is, we're always commenting on Facebook about, Deb Longworth Rumsa's incredible sewing art, you know, and she has uh, fabulously shared her talents with me a couple of times over the years. So uh, like she makes, she made this incredible outfit for sweet little Aurelia when she was born and she's six now. So who knows where the outfit went, but it was just really special. And um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And I love how you bring uh, just like joy and like power to like everyday art that like help, you know, like that people contribute. Anyways, I thought that was really cool. I have another question from you from Patty. She asked, okay. if you were asked to narrate a woman of courage story today, whose life would you choose and why? Why didn't I think of this question? Um, oh my. Hmm. Maybe, uh, well, hmm. I don't know if I would choose me for the narrator, but if there was a, 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 a record that would come out and a song written about her, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I just really admire her everything, <laughs> her uh, approach to life, her nonstop mm, life force, uh, her caring for others, her ability to express herself. And um, oh, another one though, who's the woman who's always, um, uh, uh, questioning people in in Congress, and she's fabulous at it. Come on, you guys. <laughs> she uh, sent me a fundraising email. I can't remember her name, but at any rate, you know, incredibly intelligent and entertaining women um, that exemplify so much courage in the face of, you know, a lot of the craziness that we are putting up with now. Shoot, I do one about Patty, who asked the question, because I love her art and I love, my goodness, have you people seen on Facebook when I shared, Patty has been involved a few years with a project down in the Twin Cities every winter called Art Shanties. Mm -hmm. And the last couple of years, she created an art project called, just a minute, I'll get it, Fashion Disasters. So it focuses on climate disaster and the different disasters that are coming out of climate change. And then she and her other artist friends 
created costumes to embody each disaster. So she was wildfire the first year and just incredible, incredible visual. And then of course she had things to say and <laughs> manages as an artist to get coverage uh, this year from Sven Sungard, is that his last name? The, we the local weather person um, who's fabulous. And, you know, it all, it, the, the conditions of our lives inspire what we care about, which then inspires to express about it, however uh, you express it, whether it's uh, visual art or musical art or theatrical art. Oh, oh, who else would I do? Anyway. I did want to talk about an artistic experience. One reason I'm happy, have my most recent reason to be like extremely happy to have the, had the opportunity to live by my art um, and be connected to the theater community here was this last fall, I got to participate in a play and I haven't participated in a play since, you know, the early 1980s. Uh, and there's a theater company in the Twin Cities called 10,000 Things. And they did a production of Iphig Iphigenia at Aulis outdoors. And I got to be part of a very large chorus, thank goodness. Because then if I forgot a word or hit a wrong note, nobody would notice. But it was just astonishing to be able, again, to witness such a powerful production um, from being inside of it. You know, so that was a gift. And, and the power it had on audiences um, was phenomenal, made me understand why theater is so useful and why it attracted me. That's so cool, Terry. So right now in our community, um, the community theater uh, is doing the Anne Frank, Thires of Anne Frank, and it's, it's incredible. Um, and as a you know, person who's our library is small, so I get to see lots of people in the community, and that power you talked of about theater and of, like eliciting responses um, and reactions, like all week long, people have been coming in and talking about the play, and we're a tiny community. I mean, like eighteen hundred people in the the surrounding area, and just the like ability to like immerse yourself in history in this case um, and expand your mind and live through and work through really important uh, things um, it, it's just really cool so anyways Especially. that's fun that you, go ahead oh I was just gonna say I was just like a fun connection to the theater experience you shared yeah people just it's a, such an emotional and um, uh, deep connection I think that you get in theater that you maybe can't get in film because the people are right there. <laughs> and thank you for bringing that particular production up because, you know, it's something that, you know, when I first saw that movie, the old movie de many decades ago and or read the book in school, um, it, it never you know, there's so many things we can say this about now. We never thought in a million years it would be an essential message to beam out again that, you know, people need to learn about uh, anti-Semitism, you know, in specific, but it's, it's really bigger than that, you know? And so it's so timely and I'm glad that your theater company is doing it. And I'm glad that Patty did all the costumes. I know she's been working so hard at it. So what else are we gonna say? Oh, I did. 
Um, does anybody have questions that we haven't addressed? Oh, silence. Mary, yeah. uh, I'm interested if, if there is an unknown woman who has particularly inspired you personally, someone whose story has yet to be told. Ooh, ooh. Well, you know, the first woman that comes to mind is my mother, you know, because I know many things about her life that I don't know if uh, it would inspire others, but it certainly inspired me. You know, it was uh, to see how hard she worked to become a strong, independent woman. Um, having, you know, been born during the depression and grown up in a tar paper shack with an alcoholic father, you know, and uh, they were just, you know, she accomplished a great thing, having a stable, well-fed, <laughs> sheltered, clothed family and uh, uh taught us how to get through anything, you know. I'm sure like a lot of your parents, you know, taught you how to get blood out of a turnip when necessary. And um, we all made it through because of that. How I ask you that question, Mr. Me? Jim. Oh God, my mother. It's like, yeah, the mother is, is pretty important. Um, uh, for me, it, it, mother read to me, mother read to us uh, stories. How about that? Stories. Um, every night of our lives, we got a Bible story and then we got a fun story. And um, um, uh, so much of how I think, the, the, literally the words of those stories come back to me sort of every day in, in, uh, uh, on occasions. So. We have the same answer. That I think what, that was Thank explained you. to us too. <laughs> Thank you for answering that. I um and I I think of the arts we were all exposed to as children. That some of us are you know using to this day, or all of us are using to this day. But they, you know, you just we just took them for granted. Storytelling, story writing. You know, the pictures in the storybooks, you know, it's like, uh, oh, that's art, you know, and sometimes we have to be reminded, or I've certainly had to be reminded that what we do is an art. I've told people sometimes that uh, uh, somebody asked me this years ago, and the first thing that popped into my head, I said, when I do massage and I'm in the zone, I feel like it's a combination of sculpture and dance. And that is what it feels like to me when I'm really in it, you know, because it's a, it's an expression. It's a sharing of energy. And that's what I appreciate when I know an artist is really sharing their heart, is really sharing their energy with me, with all of us, you know, uh, and it might be a real small, intimate idea, or it might be an enormous, you know, universal idea, um, but it's powerful. I, I was intrigued in your introduction, in the introduction, um, that uh, it was said that uh, you had wanted this to be a conversation. And I, I think, um, there is there, there's a sense that I I continually have the conversation is the ultimate art because the 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 participants in the conversation are all creating something and no one knows where it's going to go and it it, it has spontaneity it has surprise for everybody and um, it, it it at its best is the truest uh, connection and connection for me is is kind of the basis of all art. Perfectly said. I can't add a single thing to that. I just, yeah, conversation. Well, as all of my friends know, I can talk forever, you know. <laughs> and so <Yeah>. I, <laughs> I, if you've ever been, <laughs> if you've ever been 
on the other end of me leaving you a voice message, you know, <laughs> I, I may have to call you three times to say what I have to say. Oh my goodness. So that's why, I mean, I have laughed at myself several times over the last month or so preparing for this because I thought, well, I can talk, but I can't write a speech anymore. You know, my brain doesn't work that way. And I kind of don't want to. I, I want to talk to people, you know. That's so, one of the lovely things about conversation. I think you discover what you think without having prepared it. It's kind of like, I didn't know I thought that. Right, right, right. I love it. Well, to, to thank you. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. And... Um, all of you in attendance here are people that I love to talk to or with. I should say that with. <laughs> so, um, and I look forward, I'm looking at Peggy now because uh, we haven't had lunch in so long. I know, you know I, was, I was thinking too, um, when you're talking about art, um, I'm, I am an avid reader. And um, I think the ability of people to create um, a picture with words is just so intriguing. And I think one of the last books that I read was called The Book Thief. And it is a, a story about, I, I think it might be fiction, but I'm not sure, but it takes place in Anne Frank's time of um, the Holocaust and all that. And um, the, the connection that we're feeling now with Ukraine and with what's going on in the world today. And I just think it's fabulous that you're bringing the Anne Frank story um, back uh, because I, I think that it has great value for for everyone to just never forget thank you that is a beautiful book yeah it's just yeah. incredible book and yeah. um i think you're exactly right um which makes me think of how excited i was oh gosh when over 10 years ago when I lived in Plymouth, I, you know, I hadn't been in what's recognized as the arts, you know, mm -hmm. for a long time, a couple of decades. And, and a friend of mine joined the Plymouth, Art, the Plymouth Arts Council and encouraged me to do the same. And so I did. It's a volunteer position and you have, but you have to go through like a job interview and they check your background, you know, to make sure you're not going to show up with an AR-15. And uh, at any rate, um, uh, and I thought my friend and I would uh, get a little theater going in Plymouth, right? <laughs> probably, because that was the background for both of us. Well, that didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, they needed somebody to head up a committee. The chair had decided to leave uh, called Plymouth Reads which was the book program to try and get the whole town to read a book. And so it was my honor to do that for four years. And, um, and I get to, even though I moved, I get to keep my toe in and read um, books, generally by local authors, but we try to look at from the five state area because uh, we're reading throughout the year to to be able to recommend to the committee, which I'm not on anymore, a book that they could promote to the whole community and get the author to speak. So, um, and of course we had this fabulous, have you ever heard of the book, Virgil Wander by Leif Enger? Minnesota writer, write it down. Um, if you forget, I'll tell me, I'll remember. And we love that book. And there's wild and wonderful characters in that book. And it happens in like around the Brainerd area, you know, or Bemidji, whatever. 
and there's an amazing character who flies kites. And so what uh, Plymouth Reads would do is choose the book, make sure the author could come and talk to people on a certain day and f at a certain price, and then figure out related activities to expand on the book. And so we had it set up. We had these gorgeous, amazing kites that some kite artist had created hanging from the ceiling at the Plymouth Library. And we had all this whole slate of things set up and then COVID happened. So Plymouth Reads hasn't happened since for three years. So April 20th, <laughs> Plymouth Reads is going to happen again for the first time in three years. And the author is a Minnesota author I do want to tell you guys about named Matt. No. Yes. No. Oh, boy, I guess I better. Anyway, yeah, April 20th. <laughs> Plymouth Reads. I'm pretty sure it's Matt Goldman, Minnesota author. Um, but. He's, and I read his debut novel a few years ago, and I'm like, dang, this is pretty good for a first novel. It takes place in Edina, and it's a murder mystery, and yeah, yeah it is. Oh, you're going to like this one, Jim. Um, at any rate, uh, it's called, his first novel is called Gone to Dust. Well, then I read up about him, so happens. He'd already won Emmys for writing for Seinfeld, and... Ellen or something, 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 right? So, but he lives in Minnesota now. He lives in, I don't know, Burnsville, Bloomington, something like that. At any rate, so I love that this murder, his first novel, the murder happened in Edina. And I swear it was the uh, neighborhood my sister used to live in. At any <laughs> rate, um, uh, so we did, we chose his, a, a newer novel called Carolina, Moonset, there you go. and it's a <laughs> it's a one off. It's not part of his detective series. He's got a few now in that series that started with the Edina murder, but this is a separate one, and it's slightly autobiographical. So it's a beautiful book, and April twentieth, he's going to be speaking in Plymouth. So. Whoop de doo. Anyway, I, I, I hijacked it. I hijacked it. No, that's great, Terry. Thank you so much for this amazing uh, evening. You um, uh, are a woman of courage and you inspire me. So I'm so grateful that you were here tonight and that you shared your story and we're capturing it um, because, uh, yeah, you have done inspiring things um, and are really. Um, um, making this world a better place. So thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you all, pleasure. Betsy, Jim, Peg, Patty, Jesse, who is here. I, um, I, are, do we have a 60 minute limit though? Nope, you can go a little bit more. Yeah, no, it's okay. Just, okay. Oh, Patty, I saw you put a comment. It said, thank you, Teresa. I thought it said, you're pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> She's laughing really loudly perfect. right now. <laughs> so thank you. Anyway, you can see where my head is. I've been thinking I'm pathetic for about a month. Now. But um, basically, I wanted to tell you all, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Shannon. Thank the library. Thank everybody who supports the library. I th I'll thank Zoom even. Thank you, <laughs> Betsy, for being here and Peg for being here and Patty for being here. Um, this really has been a, a top notch to me. Visit with my friends. It's that fun. I yeah. didn't think it would be like that. I thought it would be a hundred people. I didn't know I was scared stiff. So thank you for you, your you have a fabulous voice. Thank you for sharing it with us. Yes. And thanks oh. to the library and to Shannon for, for, for making it happen. Yeah. Thank you so yes. much. And, and guess it, what it, now? And it, 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 it take care of Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I will. Yeah. I don't know if you, I did blur my background, but I don't know if you saw him kind of wheeling around in the background, but he's, 